one down. One, two, three to go. Today sucks, guys. <laughs> Actually, you know what? Yesterday sucked more. I was supposed to do this yesterday, and I think, you know sometimes how the universe is just screaming at you, don't? That was yesterday. Jesse thinks he's gonna work in this, guys. My goodness, this came out of nowhere. It's springtime. I had all the tools out and then that torrential downpour. <laughs> so I guess I took a clue for once and I just abandoned the idea for today. Well, today started out rough and it's still rough. Those of you that have been following us for a while know that we put these sips on the house and we drilled a bunch of holes where the panels meet so that we could add foam to seal up the house. And those of you who've been paying attention know that we haven't foamed the house because we haven't done the electrical. There are electrical chases that are pre-run or whatever through the panels for us to pull wire. And if we inject foam between the panels, it's going to close off those electrical chases, which is why we haven't put siding on the house. But it turns out there are these tiny little buggers called red breasted nut hatches. <laughs> red breasted nut hatches. And I don't know why, but this little pink paint, see the pink paint? They love the pink paint. In our infinite wisdom, we spray painted some, but we forgot some, those holes pink so we wouldn't forget them. And I don't know why, but these red breasted nut hatches think that that means come make a nest here. And it's super funny because they literally go from pink hole to pink hole. Wait, it's not funny at all. It's literally the worst form of torture. Somewhere around 6 a.m., they come and start pecking and they're just tiny little birds, little four and a half inch bird, and they peck, 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 peck. You fall asleep and they come back an hour later and peck, peck, peck. Well, this morning, I wanted to try something. We don't want to kill the birds. I'm gonna get that out of there. We want to try to stop them from trying to build a nest in the sips. Putting siding on would solve that problem, but that's not something we can do today. We have this theory that if we get rid of the pink dots, because they don't peck on these dots, which don't have pink on them, so we thought if we got rid of the pink dots, maybe they would quit. So I painted the pink dots tan. Genius, right? And that little piece of wood right there, I put over the hole that they've pecked at the most and made it fairly large. <laughs> All the while, poor Lissa's trying to sleep. And I'm banging the ladder, the birds are pecking. And by the way, check out this clip. This is how fearless these little birds are. <laughs> Right? They're not skittish at all. It's the most ridiculous thing. I'm pretty sure I could walk up to the thing and just grab it and give it a good shake and a good talking to. Anyway, I'm tired and yesterday sucked. Today's not off to a great start either, but this project has to happen. Some of you who've been following us for a while know that I had the worst time changing the oil on this backhoe. Where the drain plug is located is above a skid plate for the drive line. And when you pull that drain plug, you can't get the oil out of there without it puking all over the drive line and the guard. And it just makes the most ridiculous mess. Oil will just go all over here. So I made the move to a quarter turn Fomoto valve the last time we did an oil change. And it was a little slow. I don't think I heated the oil up enough, but it was awesome. No mess at all. When I bought the valve for the backhoe, I actually bought a valve for the Subaru and for the sawmill. I found out that the sawmill pretty much has a pretty good system already, so I didn't install the valve, but it wasn't really ready for an oil change either. So maybe when that thing's ready for an oil change, I'll take a closer look at it and we might throw that quarter turn valve on there. It's the simplest little, I think seven or eight dollar device, push and turn, that's it. No tools, a tool free oil change, for real. Well I bought one for the Subaru, but it wasn't ready for an oil change and so I didn't wanna pull the plug and just, I don't know, make this huge, another oil mess in the name of putting a quarter turn valve on. So I've been sitting on this valve 
and today it finally got installed. Something I've been learning, spending a little bit of time around aircraft, is that they pretty much all have these quarter turn, tool free drain plugs. And there's another reason for that, aside from the fact that a lot of these engines are kind of hard to get to without removing a bunch of bodywork or cowling. It's actually pretty common to do an oil analysis in aircraft, and these are mid time analysis of oil say before it's ready to be changed and it's all about monitoring the life of your engine trying to pay attention for rings or valves or cylinders or something that are going haywire well you're never i'll say never going to be able to do an analysis with a traditional drain plug mid time you're going to have to wait till there's a change and then take your sample then i already screwed that up with the Subaru today. A friend of mine let me know about this company. They're called Blackstone Labs and they focus on fluid analysis in vehicles and equipment. So I sent them a request for a bunch of kits and I'm really curious to see what they do and how their system works. It's a very simple little black container and inside is a little white container with a clear or a clear container with a white lid. And then there's a small data sheet that you complete and send back. And one of these analysis will run you 28 bucks. Having seen this done on an aircraft, it really made sense to me as a more predictive way to get ahead of uh, wear and tear issues or as an aircraft, a catastrophic issue that might be just about to happen. Of course, with cars and trucks, it's probably a little bit less, but it's a good way to monitor the life of the engine. And I think it also adds value because it shows care. So if I were to buy a car and someone were to produce oil analysis for each time they change the oil, that would show me the person probably cared a little bit. So with aircraft, I got to see these reports and it's pretty cool. So I thought, you know what? It'd be really fun to just do this for all of our equipment and all the vehicles that we have. I don't know, you might find something out really interesting. So there's kind of a process. You're supposed to take the sample after about a quart of oil has drained out and then grab your sample and then let the rest of the oil drain. Well, I was too focused on A, not making a big mess and B, filming, and I forgot to grab my sample. So unfortunately, I had to grab my sample from pouring this guy out. And I can tell you that thing never gets totally emptied and therefore I cannot say that this is a very credible sample. But you know what? I'm gonna send it in anyway. We have a couple new pieces of equipment around here that are going to help us with the house build over the next few years. We made a decision to invest. We had rented all of these pieces of equipment and we were just spending an insane amount of money with rent, which we'll never get back. So we're super excited to have these on hand. It's gonna reduce stress and it's gonna give us a lot more freedom with the house build instead of having this go, 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 go that comes with renting equipment. But when you don't rent, now you take on the responsibility of maintenance. Both of these came to us serviced, so I'm not, I'm not too worried about them, but I have been slowly reading the manuals and getting up to speed on the maintenance and service schedules. One of those things that I wanna be able to do is an oil analysis mid-time. These pieces of equipment have 500 hour oil changes. That's a ridiculous amount of hours on a single oil change. This goes back to my point earlier about adding value to a vehicle or a piece of equipment. I know that the day will come where we'll have to sell this equipment and it'd be nice to get the, the best possible price when we do that. And I think showing or presenting to the buyer an oil analysis is gonna build confidence because the reality is you never know what somebody did to equipment, especially if it was rental equipment. So the other day, I gave up. I tried to find the thread pitch for these Fomoto valves for both of these pieces of equipment. And apparently this stuff is like national security level trade secrets. And I just wasn't able to find it. So I literally had to pull the drain plug on both pieces of equipment and go get a thread pitch measurement to get it done. In my pea brain wisdom, I literally thought I might be able to plug up the drain long enough to go get the thread pitch measurement. It didn't work. This guy holds three and a half gallons of oil. And in my wonderful idea, I thought I could plug the drain plug down here. 
and it didn't work. I lost quite a bit of oil onto the ground. This just further reinforced in my mind why we need to have these quarter turn valves on these equipment. First of all, less mess oil changes are never a bad thing. I don't have a work pit. I don't have a lot of that stuff. I'm working in the dirt and the gravel. And like today, I'm working in the rain. So it'd be nice to have a valve on there where I can just put a hose on, turn the valve, and I can put the oil right where I want it. And guess what? I can turn the valve off if I need to stop the flow of oil for some reason. With the drain plug, good luck. That's just gonna make an even bigger mess. And if you've got the oil good and hot, you're probably just gonna burn your hands. That's all that's gonna happen. So I'm excited to get these quarter turn valves on here for that reason. Tool free, no mess, oil changes, but I also wanna be able to just take a small sample. So at any time, say after 100 hours, I could come out here, turn the valve, take a small sample, send it in, and just see, make sure everything's doing fine with the engine. What I found in researching the valve lines from Fumoto is that they offer a lot of different options for lots of different applications. I know you guys who are really sharp out there were watching the valve that I put on the Subaru and the first thing that was going through your mind was, hey, that thing's gonna hang down and probably get caught on something. But I've looked it over really carefully and I've concluded that it's actually higher even still than a lot of the exhaust components. And I'm pretty sure it's going to be just fine. So they make a valve that's very low profile that doesn't include this nipple. They have valves that have no nipple and they also have valves with this very large high flow nipple. I think it's really handy to have a valve that actually has a nipple. This one is for the Kubota and it does not. There are definitely times where not having a nipple makes sense. For example, this valve actually drains straight down. So really there's no advantage and there's nothing below it. So it doesn't need to be guided away or anything like that. So in this situation, it actually makes sense not to have one. There's another reason, as you'll see on the oil pan, underneath the tail of that machine, you really wouldn't want anything sticking down. In fact, this valve still, I mean, it's only gonna be sticking out that much from the oil pan, but that's still quite a bit considering how we run these pieces of equipment and you're gonna get a lot of brush and things. So I think keeping an eye on this is gonna be really important to the longevity of the piece of equipment. But guess what? You should be checking the oil every day anyway, right? I mean, you shouldn't just be jumping in your excavator like everyone does and not checking the oil. Additionally, they have a small clip and I realize that this just looks adorable in the scheme of things given you know the power of these pieces of equipment. But the idea is that it clips over the valve handle here and prevents it from turning. It actually prevents it from coming up so if the valve can't come up, then it cannot turn. And that's their security device. I've heard of people uh, zip tying this and things to keep it from becoming an issue. There's a learning curve here. I'm gonna have to figure this out. But this valve is gonna be a lot easier to grab an oil sample from and then also do a no mess tool free oil change. For the equipment, I went with both high flow valves. So they have a larger orifice and I think that's really important for these high capacity engines. The excavator's not too bad, but the telehandler's three and a half gallons of oil. And so having a larger nipple, I think makes a lot of sense. Well, that looks like it fits really good. There's actually a hole right here in the subframe and it looks like I should be able to either just drain it straight down. I don't even know that we need to put a hose on here, but either way, being able to start and stop the flow makes a lot of sense. And then just putting a sample bottle underneath here to grab a small sample, I think this valve is gonna work great. And what I'm really happy is that this is actually an enclosed engine compartment. So there's very little chance that something, a sticker maybe could come up through here and mess with this. But we've got that little valve lock on there. And of course, if we check the oil every day, we're never gonna run dry. 
because of a lazy operator or just a surprise. I think the really frustrating thing about these valves, especially on things that have long oil cycles, and I say long because we're not obviously a commercial operator, so we're not putting, you know, 100 hours a month on a piece of equipment, is that you have to take the the doggone drain plug out to get the measurement. So I don't know if that's something that Fomoto can work on or somebody, but I, I couldn't believe how hard it was to figure out what the thread pitch is of an oil drain plug. I mean, I get that some, you know, we don't lose oil drain plugs very often. On the Subaru, it wasn't that hard at all. Uh, but this equipment, I can't believe these manufacturers just, either they don't have the information, which just seems improbable, or they just don't want to share it. I don't know. Um, and I think the really hard part here was that I actually had to leave these machines dry for several days because I had to pull the plug, go to town, get a pitch measurement, find the plug, order it, and then wait. And I didn't want to put the oil, any oil, back in the machine because then I have to drain it back out again. So I've left these pans dry for probably about four days um, thanks to Amazon Prime. It worked out pretty good. I just wish there was a better way. And I've tried engine codes and manufacturers and the manual and the service department. And I've short of asking the people who rent these equipment to like, could you just do an all change real quick so I can check your drain plug? That's probably the most frustrating part of these things. As you can see, it's like a five second install. I mean, it's other than that, it's problem free. I think of all the equipment we have, the most likely to have a problem is going to be the excavator. Um, I'm happy to see, you know, that this valve obviously is designed to be tucked away. We've got the valve lock on there, but let's be honest, you know, it's this tiny piece of plastic, which <laughs> how many sticks is it going to take to just jab that? You know, there's got to be... I don't know, a better way to do that for sure. It doesn't, doesn't make me feel super confident having this guy down here. And of course you can't see it. So I think if I was to zip tie this, I'd probably feel a little bit better. I think the real issue here is that this cannot come up. Um, I think the other side is that pushing it up isn't gonna cause a problem. You'd have to physically pull it down, but you know what, under an excavator, <laughs> I guess anything's possible. I've heard horror stories about rocks, you know, on the tracks and stuff. and. But I think if you can see, we're not hanging below the skid pans or anything. I guess we'll have to just see how this goes. I'm gonna keep all the drain plugs for everything. Obviously, I'm not gonna throw them away. And then we'll test these for a little while. And um, if everything's going good, we'll stick with it. And if we start having problems, well, guess what? We'll just go back to what we were doing before. Or maybe find another solution, but isn't that nice, guys? I mean, a quarter turn, boom, and then put the the handle lock on there and you're in business. These things are gonna get a little bit dirty, but who cares? You know, you're not putting oil in them. You're only taking oil out. And everything here is high quality. This is brass and stainless steel, a nice stainless steel C-clip in there. So I'm not worried about corrosion. I think this will probably last the lifetime of the equipment so long as we don't bang it up. There's a part of me that wonders if, you know, you could put some sort of protective. I don't know about welding to oil pans. I guess you guys would probably know better about that, but part of me thinks that welding some sort of just guard on here might be doable. Um, I think it's worth it for the convenience of this and then also just being able to take samples. There is one more small disadvantage that I think is worth mentioning. I think, you know what, both of these don't seem to, but I know the backhoe had a magnet on the uh, drain plug and you know it made a lot of sense and somebody emailed me about that and gosh I can't remember what they emailed me about I'm thinking it might have just been to put a magnet on the oil pan you know that way you've got some magnetic force there that's going to collect any metal or anything that comes off the engine of course it have to be magnetic such as steel and these drain plugs don't seem to have those magnets. So I guess in that way, we're not really losing anything by putting the Fomoto valve on here.
right below the alternator. Really, Kubota? <laughs> really? <laughs> so now what? We like bend oil so that it goes where we want and doesn't where we don't or what? My goodness. Ugh, it's gonna take all day. So because I had to pull the drain plug in order to get the Fomoto valve uh, thread pitch, the, the drain plug thread pitch, putting these valves in cost me probably an extra $70 in oil. Both of these machines, like I said, were serviced when we purchased them. So they've got new filters all the way around and there's no need to replace those. We have practically no time on both of these machines but I didn't want to put the old oil back in. I suppose I could have, but given the drama around getting the oil out of here, I was like, you know what? In the end, I guess oil's cheap given the amount of hours it's gonna be in this machine. So in that sense, these valves, putting these valves in cost me quite a bit more than I probably wanted. But my thinking was I'd rather have the ability to do an analysis now than be stuck not being able to do that and have that royal mess come when I'm trying to do an analysis later. Three down, one to go. I heard a rumor that a neighbor stopped by and dropped off something super yummy. And as a reward for getting three Fomoto valves installed, I think I wanna come check it out. What happened? Do you want me to do the honors? Yeah, what is it? She said it was like hot and fresh. Holy it's banana bread. mackerel with nuts. Wow, so beautiful. Oof, that looks like it'll hit the spot. Wow. Can you cut me a slice? Yeah. That's pretty good. I probably have should have some, less, but I'm gonna have more. We have, have some more. raspberry jam in the fridge. Oof. That would be really great. This and a glass of tea. The best kind of jam is uh -huh. pomegranate jam on Which banana bread. Which we heard a rumor that pom pomegranate jam's coming our way. Mm. Amazing. I don't know why. When you make banana smoothies, my tummy gets all excited. But there's cooked banana, and cooked banana doesn't bother my tummy. Isn't that weird, guys? So if you don't like bananas in your smoothies, try banana bread. Somehow, it's magic and chemistry and stuff. Thanks for the snack. You're welcome. I'll see you Before soon. You okay, thanks, neighbor. Thank you. So the last one on my list, this guy. The only thing is Fumoto, they don't make a valve for this guy. For those of you that own this truck from a certain model year, I think around 2011 up to like 2015 maybe, 2016, something like that, know that this guy has a proprietary composite oil pan and it also has a quarter turn, mind you, uh, drain plug. But it's not a valve, it's just a plug. So you still get the awesome bath of oil, uh, you just don't have any way to drain it. And it's kind of tool free, but not really. It just doesn't require a wrench. I'll, I'll try to show you. This replacement drain plug, it actually has a valve in here that's spring loaded. And this little uh, accessory 
is the drain tool. It's got a little O-ring on it, and this little plug keeps this drain plug clean between oil changes, and it also just has a little O-ring, something like that. And so to change the oil, or to take an oil sample, you simply remove this cleaning plug that protects the valve. Take your drain plug, which has a fitting for a hose on it, and as you thread this in, this valve in the back will open, and the more you thread it in, the more it opens, unseating this little O-ring here, and now this will drain. Of course, it's not gonna drain nearly as fast as an opening this large, but if you're not in a huge hurry or you're not doing fleet equipment, I guess, uh, then this wouldn't be a big deal. And of course, as you remove this tool, the spring reseats the O-ring and you're back into the drain plug position and then simply add your cleanliness plug back on there. And just like that, you're ready to go again. They recommend keeping this drain tool in the truck or in the glove box or something. I think that makes a lot of sense. So it's not a quarter turn, but it is a valve that you can use to just take a sample and you can also do just tool-free clean oil changes. Everything can be done with your fingers. So this drain plug is actually a quarter turn and it only requires a 3 8 inch ratchet. And it does, it just quarter turns and comes right out. It's a composite plug. And because of that, there's no threads in here. It's kind of a, it's a proprietary design. And it definitely comes out fast. And given, I think, I can't remember how many quarts are in here. I wanna say like 13 or 15 or something. It definitely drains quickly. Big, big drain plug, no threads. So because Fomoto doesn't have this design, they're not able to probably manufacture an equivalent plug. We've been using a synthetic oil in this truck, and I think we can probably go at least 7,500 miles between oil changes, but really that's where the analysis comes in. If we're having issues, we might, might want to test the oil and not change it, just see how the oil is holding up, which is something that they can tell you, how's the viscosity and the detergent level, etc. But I'm not taking that drain plug out and trying to drain into that little vial, right? So I found a company that actually makes a drain plug that is a direct replacement for the factory plug but it has a quarter turn valve in it. The truck is not ready for an oil change, but I want to get this stuff checked off my list and it's nice to just get it done. So I'm going to try my luck at taking this plug out. <laughs> you guys are totally going to laugh at me because it's going to happen. I'm going to try to take this plug out and I'm going to try to stick the new plug in and uh, hopefully we don't lose too much oil. about right there all that went in so it's not a complete failure I'm wondering if I got that in there backwards or something it doesn't seem like it's all the way in there finally got it figured out I think so if we just take this protective cap off and then we hand rotate this drain tool I've just been watching this for a second because I feel like I saw a couple of drips on the bottom. But this whole thing is sealed up by an O-ring. It's not a tightness thing or a, you know anything like that. There's just an O-ring that keeps everything sealed up, and that's that's how the factory one was. But well, I guess we'll just keep an eye down here and see if anything happens. But let's put this drain tool in here. The oil should start to slowly come out as we open that guy, and it shouldn't be much. There we go. And then if we back off, that spring check valve in there should stop. <laughs> you guys see a pattern? I do. That thing's gonna fall in every bucket of oil you drain. Good luck fishing it out of there. Can't tell, I guess we'll let that drip for a little bit and see if it stops. I don't know if I trust that valve or not. I guess this nut does have an O-ring on it. So, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna do something. Not sure I trust it to stop a leak. I think I feel pretty good about this. I think if I get this all cleaned up and then we can actually take our oil sample. I've been watching that for a few minutes and it looks to me like other than just a little bit of oil kind of in here, um, seems pretty leak free. So they want you to try to take a sample either hot or cold, but what they don't want you to do is take a sample that's kind of in between 
any water or fuel that might be present in the oil is going to kind of skew the result. So if you're going to take it cold, just take it cold, which this engine takes quite a bit to warm up. So we'll just take a cold sample. Cool. That was really easy compared with the uh, either dump all the oil out or get an oil bath. And we'll just put this plug back in here. And this is just to protect the valve all of the rest of the time. And these are all, I think this thing's just billet aluminum, so should be fairly resistant to corrosion from salt and whatnot. Looks pretty good. That was fairly painless compared to what I figured it would be. Looks like we lost maybe not even a pint or less oil doing that. So we'll just call that good luck. That'll be nothing to add back. I think because of all the dirt and things that fell off around the drain plug, just not worth it putting this oil back in. We'll just add fresh oil. So the only thing left to do is to sample the oil for the Kubota and the telehandler. And since I made a big mistake and in my foolishness thought I was just going to drain a little bit of oil and plug it up, I end up having to drain all the oil out of both of those machines, right? So I did save the oil. So in that way, I guess I'm ahead of the curve. I do have some oil to send off. I've got the Kubota here and this big wad over here is the telehandler. So I'm gonna follow their instructions and I'm just gonna sample both of these cold. I think the point of this for me is it's just an exercise. You know, I, if these analysis come back wonky, I'm not gonna panic or anything. Um, I'll just take it as, as an experience. So all we have left to do now is to complete this analysis form. It's not very tedious. They want to know some things like a unit ID, which is your own ID so you know what you're sampling, how many miles or hours are on the oil, how many miles or hours are on the engine, and then how much you added oil type and between oil changes, which just kind of gives them an idea about dilution. We'll put our credit card information on here. We'll answer a few basic uh, questions like was the oil changed when the sample was taken. Um, if the sample was taken cold, I think they say to put that on here so they know. And then we ship them off. This is ridiculously small to see, but it's a miniature version of the analysis report that they give you. This is just a sample. And the reason they're looking for the hours or the miles on the engine is they actually have a database of similar engines, like for example with cars and some equipment. I imagine they don't have everything. But what they can do is compare the, um, the results with similar engines, with similar hours or similar miles, and it kind of just gives you an idea where you're at. Of course, each time you sample your own engine, that's going to be good to compare with the last. But it's also nice to kind of know for similar make and model or similar engines where you kind of stand and what norm, what where or whatever might be normal. So this is a ridiculously small version. Um, they do email it to you and then I don't know if they actually send you a paper copy or not. I guess we're about to find out. This is just one of those little details, but they do include this little oil change reminder sticker, which for cars makes sense for equipment. We use a, a label maker and then we also keep a worksheet for everything. But if you're looking for that little guy, how many of us have tried to find those when we go to those oil change places? We sure do like them. And they actually include those with their kit. They don't charge anything for the kit. You just can order them from their website. Um, they do charge you, of course, when you send the sample in and and they'll run your credit card once you're sampled. That's kind of nice. Like I actually ordered a few extra kits just so that I don't have to worry about having them on hand. So when I'm ready to sample, I can do it and then I don't get charged until I send it in. I almost forgot I wanted to grab a sample out of the backhoe. Might have to get the hose out. Oh, there we go. I don't know if we're gonna get a full sample or not, but well, we got some. <laughs> we missed a little bit. I probably should have got the little hose and put it on there, but 
I think they'll be able to sample that. I also think this is probably not going to be a very good sample because quite frankly just sampling the bottom of the oil pan is probably going to give you a really skewed result. But I think this is all just about learning for me. The first one that we did the sample on, you remember the Subaru, we kind of screwed the sample up. And by say we, I mean me. <laughs> but the report has come back very good. It says that your engine looks very strong for 220,000 miles. That's a lot of miles, guys. And it says that uh, the only thing that looks a little out of sorts is the iron. And they're thinking because we went 6,500 miles on the oil, that might be the reason because the universal averages, which is what they use to kind of compare your engine to other engines, uh, that one actually is about a 5,000 mile oil change. So they actually recommend on this uh, result to go 8,500 miles on an oil change and see what happens. So they're recommending going another 2,000 miles. So it turns out the oil sample didn't screw things up, it looks like. Of course, the nice thing about this company is they keep records for you um, from each sample to the next. And so if something's out of sorts on the next oil change compared with the previous, we'll know. Next up, the forklift, the telehandler. So this one was kind of a weird sample because like I said, these pieces of equipment came to us with fresh oil and filters. And so there really wasn't much time on this guy except for maybe an hour and a half or so. Not a great way to sample oil. So the result says that there's no obvious mechanical problems. Everything looks really good except for you might want to give it a few hours before we sample it again because everything just looks fine. There was a little bit of uh, metals in the oil and the report says they think that's probably just from the previous uh, fill since there's obviously very little time on the oil that's in the engine but compared to other engines of similar type everything came back good they actually checked the viscosity on the oil which will come up later and they verified that the viscosity that I said the oil was in fact matched so so far the bill of health on the forklift is good and they're recommending about 200 hours before we try another sample Next up is the mini excavator. Uh, same thing here, there really wasn't much time on the oil. It was only about 20 hours, which is nothing compared with the recommended oil change cycle. Everything looks really good. In fact, it says that they are appropriately low everything for the 24 hours. They're recommending to go at least like 50 hours before you do an oil sample on this guy. Otherwise, it's really not uh, beneficial. One thing that did come up on the excavator oil sample was the viscosity. Their test shows that the viscosity was actually a 1030 weight oil. I told them that it was a 1540. I actually didn't know that because I'm not the one that put the oil in the machine. And while the machine can run on 1030, I chose to put 1540 in it because of the temperature range of that oil. And so it's very likely that what was in there was actually 1030. And they tell you that because they want to help you understand the oil and whether it's breaking down or performing as advertised. Next up is the Ford truck. So we changed the oil at 4,300 miles on this guy. Excuse me, we did not change the oil, we sampled it. And their notes say that the wear that the oil is showing is actually more like 6,800 miles. Wait, that's not good. That's about 2,500 miles more than we actually have on that oil. And they said it's not enough to really worry about. That actually may just be normal for our truck. And of course, over time, as we do more changes and more samples, we'll get to know this truck better. But they did note that there was more metal in the oil than they probably would see on an average. Instead of panicking on this one, they recommended to just run this oil for another couple thousand miles, which is actually what we plan to do. I think we're on a 7,500 mile oil change cycle with this truck. So we'll probably put another couple thousand miles on it and then send in another sample and just kind of give ourselves uh, that comparison. This particular truck, we're running a synthetic 1540 in, and so an oil change is not a cheap proposition. So sampling the oil and getting every last mile out of it is a better investment than just changing the oil early. 
Something I've wondered about these diesel trucks is how good they really are as a daily driver, especially if you're not running them for a long time between starts and stops. We do try to let the truck idle, which is not wonderful, but that's something that we do to try to reduce wear on the engine. And I'm kind of curious if that's actually better or worse. I know that these diesels or diesels in general do not love to be started and stopped. They just like to get up to temperature and stay running. And since we use this as kind of a daily driver truck, we do a lot of starting and stopping with errands and things. I wonder if that's having an effect on the wear. Of course, this truck has 150,000 miles on it, so it's not a spring chicken, but I believe there's still a ton of life left in this truck. And finally, trusty old backhoe. You know, for the amount of hours on this machine, which is just over 6,000 hours, I wasn't expecting a fantastic bill of health. But at the same time, I do have to say that, that it starts great and it runs wonderful. It doesn't burn hardly any oil and the fuel consumption is right on point. Uh, so all the other indications are that the oil would come back fantastic. Sure enough, the analysis actually says that the typical wear for this oil shows about 200 and, or excuse me, 215 hours. And there was actually only about 31 hours on this oil. So based on that, this thing's doing fantastic. They were saying the viscosity was a little bit low and we're using an oil from uh, an auto parts store that's called CarQuest. I don't know how, who actually makes it, but that's the label that's on it. And they see that that oil is using some sort of kind of additive package in there. They said none of that's really alarming per se. They just want me to know about it. And it looks like that viscosity being a little low is kind of weird. My thinking is that that may be related to the oil change being done when the oil was cold. I was curious whether that would end up becoming a factor. We did that with the truck, the forklift, the excavator, and the backhoe. The Subaru was the only one that was even remotely warm. At this point, it doesn't look like that really jeopardized the samples, but of course, over time as we build um, a history with these machines and, and vehicles, we're gonna get to know their personality a little bit better. I would say this experience was totally worth the headache and the hassle of dealing with spilled oil and the rain and all those other things. I think having information, maybe that's because I'm a really data-driven person, I don't really like to fly by the seat of my pants too much, especially with really valuable things. I think having some sort of baseline lets you know when something is out of the ordinary. I don't think that in and of itself means that something is wrong, it just kind of draws your attention. There's a term in business called exception reporting, and it's this theory that when everything's going normal, the things that are not going normal stand out. And maybe as a, a pilot, that's something that we also do. We tend to try to create um, procedures so that when something isn't working correctly, it's very easy to diagnose and what action to take is often quite obvious. Whereas if you don't have any baseline or there's no procedure, then it's just chaos. Like I said before, we kept all of the factory drain plugs for all this equipment that we've removed. I'm really curious long term to see how having these quarter turn Fomoto valves works and does it really improve our life that much? My gut says it's gonna work, but keep these just in case. One thing I liked about working with Blackstone is that as soon as I sent samples in, they actually sent me some new kits. So I've got these on hand and it's nothing to send in a sample. Of course, they're making recommendations about when to do so and minimizing your cost is never a bad thing. But I, I look forward to actually maintaining this equipment well and monitoring the health. That way we don't just have an equipment failure or some sort of problem and think to ourselves, what's happening? I'd rather just know. Mm -hmm.